Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. We talk a lot about series of books on here. And eye-opening ones, smart ones, thought-provoking ones, even funny and lighthearted ones. But today we wanted to bring you two short story collections that are kind of... playful? Yeah, I guess that would be the right word. In both interviews, you can hear the author sort of revel in the sandbox of their heads. In a bit, we'll hear from Helen Oyeyemi about her 2015 book, What Is Not Yours Is Not Yours, that uses keys in both literal and metaphorical ways. But first, I wanted to let you in on a little NPR secret. Producers love getting hosts to say wild stuff. There's nothing funnier than hearing someone transition from a piece about like inflation or something to talking about radioactive cockroaches and Hitachi magic wands. But NPR's Mary Louise Kelly pulls it off in her interview with author Gwen Kirby about her book, Shit Cassandra Saw. If I told you that Gwen Kirby's debut collection of short stories was wild, that would not begin to capture it. There's one in which the female characters grow fangs and become radioactive cockroach warriors seeking revenge on men who annoy them. There's one titled Mary Reed is a Cross-Dressing Pirate, The Raging Seas, 1720. I mean, how can you not want to read that? The title of the first story contains not one but two words that I am not allowed to say on public radio, and it manages over five short pages to tuck in mentions of... Tap Dancing, Twizzlers, NAFTA, the Cordless Hitachi Magic Wand, and Trojans, both the condom and the guys who fought the Trojan War. The title of the book, which I'm also not allowed to say, is Cassandra Saw. Gwen Kirby, welcome. Thank you so much, Mary Louise. It's a pleasure to be here. Did you have as much fun writing these stories as I had reading them? Almost all of them, yes. Uh, I loved just sort of letting myself loose in these stories. But I think letting yourself loose as a writer is actually one of the most difficult things to do, Uh, especially when you start to get towards the end of writing your book and you think like, oh my gosh, I just just need to finish this. That's a very unfun mindset. But I mean, once you've got a radioactive cockroach on the page, you just... It's going to scatter somewhere. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So I did have a lot of fun Uh, writing these stories. Often felt incredibly cathartic, and I've really needed that over the past, well, many years at this point. God, yeah. Well, and I hadn't thought about it, but specifically after coming up on two years of the pandemic, a little cockroach escapism must have been welcome. Um, Stay with the cockroach story, which also includes werewolf women. How did you come up with it? I was living in Exeter, New Hampshire, and it was the day of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Uh And I was, I had a lot of time on my hands. And so I I was just listening to them all day. And I was so angry, uh, I think, as a lot of women were. And I, I wanted to write, but I had no idea what to do. And so I just sort of started writing these paragraphs where I would just start with like, a man is annoying and a woman eats him. (laughs) <laughs> and I just, it was just sort of this like cathartic, I mean, you know, I wasn't thinking like this will be a piece of serious literary fiction that will go in my book or something. I just, I just wanted to feel for a moment, like we just wouldn't have to take it. Yeah. And, and as I kept writing, you know, and those sort of those little fantasies started to spin out a bit more and more, I, you know, started to then think about what's the price for those kind of fantasies. I mean, I don't think anyone wants to imagine harming another person. I certainly don't. The story's not suggesting anyone should do that, but I, it was sort of both the, the pleasure of imagining it and the sadness of needing to imagine it, I feel like ended up really colliding in that, in that story for me. That's so interesting, the sadness of needing to imagine it, because the title I'll mention is A Few Normal Things That Happen A Lot. I, I don't know anyone, any woman who has not experienced um, uh, men acting like a jerk or harassing her. And and you shouldn't have to grow fangs to fend off lecherous men. So it was, I won't say pleasurable to read you imagining that one might, but um, it, it was, it's an interesting balancing act between the real anger that's in this story. And it's awfully funny as well. Thank you. It was a little pleasurable to write. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I almost hesitate to ask if there's a common thread among these stories because they're all utterly original. But if I were trying, I might go with empowered women. What do you think? Yeah, I think that that's true. I think empowered women and I 
I really want to then add on the word complicated women. I, I guess perhaps because it's really empowering to get to be complicated, to be imperfect, to screw up. I feel like the the women in my book lie and cheat and fight and love and do everything that the male characters that I grew up reading got to do. And I never thought about it. No one really ever called them an unlikable male narrator or something like that. So I think, yes, empowered women, but I just think, I don't know, alive women, <laughs> just normal, real women. Yeah. Give us another example. Tell us tell us one of the other characters in here that was um, that was a lot of fun and maybe empowering to write. I loved writing the story, um, Midwestern Girl is Tired of Appearing in Your Short Stories. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like the title is its own story. My, t- my titles may have gotten away from me. Uh, that story was inspired twofold. I, I was at this reading at a, a writing conference and this man was was reading a story and there was a woman in the story who was just called Midwestern Girl. It was, it was so jarring and strange and as I stood there, I just thought, like, that'd be a great name for a superhero, you know, Midwestern girl. Right. And at the same time, I was reading The Slush Pile for a literary magazine, and I was really struck how many sort of, like, nameless women were there to say something to the male protagonist, to utz him along his journey, and then they would just fade away again into the background. And I, I guess a little bit like with the cockroach story, just sort of began writing these small instances where a Midwestern girl sort of becomes sentient and realizes that she's trapped in these stories that she doesn't have any control over. But as the story goes on, she takes herself to the front of the narrative and she sort of breaks the control of the writer, if you will, to to become her own person. And I felt that it was deeply pleasurable to write because I've read way too many stories where the woman just doesn't get named at all. Yeah. What kind of reaction have you gotten from male readers to these stories so far? Is there a recognition or are they like, hey, wait a minute, no. I have not heard a lot from male readers. I mean, I have I have male friends who are writers who are, have been very, very supportive of what I do. I will say when I read the WikiHow article about retiling the bathroom, which is about this woman who is going through a divorce and so she decides to retile her bathroom to rather disastrous results. I've had a number of male readers come up to me afterwards to correct me on how to properly retile a bathroom. Le- <laughs> that's that's leading, what caught their attention. Yeah, the, leading, the grouting leading, aspect think, of the story. Yeah, yeah, they're like, I don't, I wouldn't put the fin set on like that. I was like, I think you may have missed the forest for the trees <laughs> with this one, uh, sir. So I, I I don't know yet completely how men will react, but I, you know, I think it's so defaulted for women to read men's stories and to think like, yes, of course I identify with the male experience is the universal experience. And to be a woman writing women's stories, it's like, oh, well, you know, these will be for women. But I think that's absurd. There's No reason a man wouldn't connect with the experience of feeling lost in the world or alone in the world or battered by the world just because it's a woman writing about it. I think people should should open their minds and consider it. And don't tell me any more about bathroom tiling. I know. I know. It's, you know, (laughs) I did my best. (laughs) Gwen Kirby. Their collection of short stories is... Cassandra saw. It has been a total pleasure both to read them and to speak to you. Thank you. It's been a joy. Thank you so much, Mary Louise. Fairy tales play an important role in Helen Oyeyemi's collection, What Is Not Yours Is Not Yours. And there's an exchange in this interview with NPR Steve Inskeep where she talks about how the world can change, perspectives on a story can change, but fairy tales are one of the few types of stories that can endure. We are about to hear a key to a writer's mind. Actually, that's sort of a pun. The writer in question is the acclaimed novelist Helen Oyeyemi. She has now written a book of short stories that all have something in common. Every story involves a character who has a key. There's something about a key in and of itself that's so suggestive. Um, Even the shape of it, um, you can hold a key and just imagine so many different things about it. A key opens a door or a chest, some hidden space. 
Oyegemi's new book is called What is Not Yours is Not Yours. Often enough, her stories wander a little past the edge of realism, and that style is characteristic of this British author. She is a world traveler who was born in Nigeria, has lived in Eastern Europe, is now at the University of Kentucky, and who fell in love with Keys while in Egypt. She went with a friend to look through the markets of Cairo. We were wandering around these bazaars, and they all had swords and keys. As souvenirs, keys are probably more portable. <laughs> so I just collected I collected keys. You don't you don't get stopped at the uh, airport metal detector. Yeah, you know, with questions about your intentions. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was better to carry these keys away with me and think about them. Um, but 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 help me out here because throughout these stories, people have keys around their necks. They're unlocking doors and so forth. But you were talking about a key as if it's almost as dangerous as if you'd bought the sword in that Cairo bazaar. Yes, there is a strange way. In which that is true. I think that keys can cut. It divides property. It separates what is yours from what is not yours. A key defends what you have, but it also protects other people's property from you. Well, I want people to know there are bits of traditional storytelling in here. The first words in the book, I believe, are once upon a time. Yeah. But I I don't want to say that these are in any way traditional stories. Uh, I feel that what happens is you have a you have a young woman, she's an orphan, she's got a key around her neck and so you're sort yeah. of understanding her life as a as a very modest uh, laundress. But then a door is open to the studio of an artist and all of a sudden we're with the artist and we move from character to character almost as if um when I'm conducting internet searches, you know, you're looking for mm-hmm. one thing and then there's a link to something else and that plunges you into something else and you don't even know how you got ultimately to whatever you're reading. Yes, I think that is the interference of keys right there. <laughs> In trying to write a story about keys, you find yourself unable to write about the key directly, but you sort of make all of the leaps that a key makes. <laughs> you sort of tumble. Does this happen in your life? I think I think it's the way my mind works. I used to be sad about it, but now I just embrace it. <laughs> There's a particular passage I wonder if I could get you to read. It's in one of the short stories in this book. Sorry Doesn't Sweeten Her Tea is the name of the story. Uh, you describe a character who is in a big house, lots of rooms. Um, um, oh, the House of Locks, yes. Yes, the House of Locks. There we go. And would you just read this passage that gives a sense of what it's like to be standing there in the House of Locks? I'd love to. Nothing has actually happened to me in there. Not yet, anyway. But every time I go into that bloody house, there's a risk of coming out crazy. Because of the doors. They don't stay closed unless they're locked. Once you've done that, you hear sounds behind them. Sounds that convince you you've locked someone in. But when you leave these doors unlocked, they swing halfway out of the doorframe so that you can't see all the way into the next room and it's just as if somebody's standing behind the door and holding it like that on purpose. There's something hidden no matter what you do. Yeah. I was thinking about how I try to write about hidden things or to try and draw close to them without revealing them because there's something about actually revealing them that diminishes them, I think. Have you uh, had a personal experience that was like standing there in the House of Locks in some big empty house? Hmm. No. No, actually. I just imagined it. <laughs> Nin- 90% of my life is imagined. <laughs> You clearly love uh, fairy tales. I do. You're going after this sophisticated fiction, but you keep referring back to Snow White, as you did in the famous novel, or in a number of Little Red Riding Hood in this book of short stories. What are you doing there? Um, I am trying to find out what endures, because these stories are so old and have been retold by so many tellers and in so many different forms there's a way in which when you retell a story, you're testing what in it is relevant to all times and places. Bits of it hold up and bits of it crumble and then new perspectives come through. And I like that the fairy tale is like one of the only stories that can bear the weight of all that. Hmm. Did you read stories like Snow White when you were a little kid? Um, I did, and I was so uninterested in them. So you're an adult convert to the power of the fairy tale. That's right. And I, I don't think they're, I actually don't think they're for kids. What were you reading when you were a kid? Um, I was reading lots of orphan girl stories. So Anne of Green Gables. What else? Oh, Narnia stories. 
Peter Pan. And I was also very interested in stories about process. So like, I don't even particularly like horses that much, but stories about girls learning to ride horses or like ballet stories. And I was never interested in the bit where they became amazing and everyone was like, you're so amazing. It was the falling and getting up and the falling and getting up and what changed between each fall and each rise. That was most interesting to me. Did that speak to something you were going through in your own life? I think the things that I go through in my own life are the books that I read. Like I, I am so, I'm so in my head that that's that I feel like everything that's happened to me has happened in a book. So I don't know what life I've had. Well, this is interesting to think about. Are are books more real than I don't know the the the, the smell of the bluegrass in Kentucky or the airplane that you were on or whatever? I think everything is equally real. I think that that's part of my agenda. I'm just. I just say everything is real. It's it's just a question of different categories of of reality, I guess, and not not giving one greater precedence than the other. Helen Oyeyemi is the author of the book of short stories, What Is Not Yours Is Not Yours. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. If you want more, you can sign up for our newsletter, npr.org slash newsletter slash books. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Miranda Mazariegos and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show Elements for this week were produced and edited by Emiko Tamagawa, Ashley Lisenby, Melissa Gray, Ashley Lambie, Dee Parvaz, Justine Kennan, Megan Lim, Elena Burnett, Courtney Dorning, Meg Anderson, and Shannon Rhodes. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.